Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we will be doing the test one review for today, and uh, hopefully you have downloaded a copy of the uh, review already. Uh, so let me turn on the caption for anyone who needs this. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to go through the questions, and if you need me to elaborate on any of them, uh, just let me know, okay? The test is, of course, on Wednesday, uh, and there will be no class on Wednesday. You just have to go ahead and do the test. It will be available from uh, 6 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. The information about test one, you can find that on eCentennial. So uh, the test covers lecture one to five, as well as your beetroot report. So let's start with reviewing the beetroot experiment. First question, what is the control of the experiment? Um, so a lot of people actually got this one wrong. A control is um, the test tube that has not been manipulated. So you didn't heat it up, you didn't cool it down. So in the beetroot experiment, that would be um, the, the room temperature room temperature test tube okay so that's about uh, 20 degrees celsius 22 degrees celsius the room temperature one and the purpose of the control is to provide a reference for you to compare the other test tubes with right uh, it, it shows you what normal looks like and so any changes that you observe in the other test tube um, you will be able to compare it with the control. What is the dependent and independent variable? Um, so dependent variable is the one that we are uh, measuring or observing. Uh, in the case of our experiment, the dependent variable would be membrane permeability. Okay, so we observe the membrane permeability based on color intensity. That would be a qualitative observation where you use the senses only, no measurements, no numbers. And uh, later on in the experiment, we also measure uh, membrane permeability by using absorbance. That would be an example of quantitative observations because you're actually using number. You're trying to measure how much green light is being absorbed by your sample. So that's the dependent variable. On the other hand, the independent variable, that's the one that you've deliberately changed. In that case would be the temperature. Variables that are standardized, things that we keep constant in all the experimental groups. So that includes things like, you know, the size of beetroot, okay, uh, the source of beetroot. Are you getting it from the same beetroot? Okay, um, we have things like the volume of water in test tubes if you added too much water in one that might dilute the color right if you have too little water in another one that might make the color appear to be more intense so we don't want that we want all of them to have the same volume of water uh, another thing we should standardize is time spent in water bath right you want to leave the beetroot sitting at the various temperature for the same amount of time, right? 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever the case happens to be, right? You don't want some to be sitting there for too long, which might cause more color to come out, right? Compared to the others. The whole point of standardizing variable is to allow us to see that any changes in the dependent variable 
any variation we see in the membrane permeability is actually caused by a change in temperature and not anything else. Next question. This one was uh, poorly answered. Why does a frozen beadwood have similar color intensity as 80 degrees Celsius when placed in water at room temperature? I kind of gave you the answer in, uh, in class. Um, and if you need a refresher, when you freeze the beetroot, basically uh, freezing, freezing permanently, damages the cell membrane. Right, because as uh, as you freeze water, water expands, right, and the the cell inside of the cell is mostly water, uh, and that expansion uh, of the of the water, that formation of those ice crystals, will puncture the cell membrane. Okay, right? so the cell membrane is going to be full of holes, and when you when you put it back at room temperature, right, it doesn't actually matter what temperature we're talking about because they're so, it's full of holes now, so all the pigments will just leak out, okay, and, and that's why the color is going to be very intense, um, as intense as the 80 degree, okay, so freezing permanently damages the cell membrane and pigments will all leak out. even at room temperature, okay? That's that. Okay, what do we have next? What do you expect the absorbance to be if we include temperatures higher than 80 degrees? Okay, so a lot of you uh, did a graph for me and um, you know you put absorbance here, and then you put temperature here, right? And the graph looks something like this. Right? So uh, you know this this is eighty degrees, and then you know this is sixty degrees. And uh, in the in the lab, I asked you guys, right, at what temperature did the absorbance peak? And you know almost all of you said eighty. That's not technically correct, but I, I gave you guys mark anyways, okay? The proper answer is 60, okay? Peak means afterwards, it no longer change substantially, okay? So after 60, it's not really rising sharply anymore, right? It just kind of flattens out, right? Because by that point, the whole cell membrane is gone. The... High temperature has um, caused the cell membrane to break down completely. The membrane proteins that were holding it together kind of denatured and you no longer have a membrane afterwards. And so increasing the temperature further is not gonna significantly cause more pigments to come out because by then almost all the pigment has leaked out, right? So if you increase the temperature further to like 90 degrees or 100 degrees or whatever, um, you, would, you, you would expect the, um, absorbance to remain similar, okay? So uh, what do you expect the absorbance to be if we include temperatures at higher than 80 degrees? Um, so similar absorbance as 80 degrees for the reason I've explained to you, right? All the pigments are already out by that point. So this is a peak, all right? Any questions about the beetroot experiment so far? These are the questions that were, um, uh, you know, a lot of people lose marks for. That's why I choose to include them in the review. All right, moving on. Uh, scientific method. What is a placebo? Give an example of an experiment where a placebo is needed. Give another example where placebo is not needed. So a placebo is a sham treatment, right? 
right? It's basically an inert substance that has no effect on the dependent variable. Okay. And the purpose of the placebo is to minimize bias. So someone please tell me, when do we need a placebo? What kind of experiment do we uh, do, we do uh, to, to require a placebo? Anyone? When testing the effectiveness of like a new medication? Yeah, exactly, right? Okay, so uh, example where we need a placebo, right? So testing new drugs. In humans, though, right? The key point is humans. Only humans have bias. Very good. Uh, what about an example where placebo is not needed? Maybe testing fuel consumption in cars. Exactly, right? Okay, so that's uh, another one um, where you don't need one. So fuel consumption. In car, very good. Uh, like um, testing the milk yield in cows, right? We talk about so those things, animals. Right? No need for placebo. No need for placebo. Valid hypothesis. Um, we talked about this multiple times. It needs to be testable. You must be able to set up an exper set up an experiment to to test it out, and it must be potentially wrong, falsifiable. Okay. Um, you should practice writing hypothesis and you have plenty of practice in, uh, in class as well as uh, uh, on, the, on the lab, right? Um, for example, in our beetroot experiment, the hypothesis would be um, membrane permeability increases with temperature. Okay? Or you can say membrane permeability decreases with temperature. And there has to be some kind of correlation where people lose marks on the on the lab is they just told me um, membrane permeability is affected by temperature, but they didn't tell us how, right? Like how does it affect it? Does it does it cause it to go up? Does it cause it to go down? There has to be some kind of uh, correlation uh, in your hypothesis. Now, we've done something like this in the um, study guide, but let's just go through it again. Look at the test results below for testing the efficacy. That means how effective, right? Of the sleep in reducing jet lag symptoms. Which result shows the drug is effective? How can you tell? So over here, we have on the y-axis, the dependent variable, the percentage of individuals reporting symptoms of jet lag. And we have three groups, the control group, not receiving anything, placebo group, receiving an inert substance, something that doesn't do anything to jet lag, and the actual pill. And we have a total of 520 participants in this um, study. So which results, the left or the right, shows that the drug is effective. How do we know? Well, you cannot just compare the treated group with the control group. You must also take into consideration the placebo group. So on the left graph here, both placebo and the drug are successful in reducing the percentage of jet lag symptoms. So that tells you the drug does not work. 
does not work. Because taking the drug, yes, it lowers the percentage of jet lag, but so does taking a sugar pill, right? So why, why would I take the drug? I, I can just take the, take the candy and sleep better, right? Okay, so because both placebo and the treatment are significantly lower than the control, we know that the drug does not work. On the other hand, the, the graph on the right shows that only the treated group is able to reduce the percentage of jet lag um, and placebo did not bring it down, right? Taking the candy, it's not, didn't help you sleep better, which is what you would expect, right? Like if this was not a psychological thing, right? So if you get a result like that, it tells you um, that the drug, drug work, works. Any question about these two graphs? We'll show you a graph on the test. You'll be able to tell me which one works and which one does not work along with the reason. I hope. Uh, Vincent, sorry, can you say the second one? I repeat the second one, please. Sure, no problem. Okay, so here, right? Like, thank you. We have we have the control group which is not taking anything. So you expect them to to have high percent of jet lag, right? Seventy percent of people who are not taking anything at all, they have jet lag, and then they take the pill, which brings it down to forty percent or so. And then you take a look at the placebo, right? You, you give these people candies, sugar pill, right? They don't know they're taking the sugar pill, right? Uh, uh, and, and then they take it. And, and that did not do anything to help relieve the symptoms, right? So that tells you it's not a psychological effect like over here, okay? Over here, you give them sugar pill and then they take it and they sleep better, right? That, that means it's all in their mind, right? They take something and they believe whatever they're taking help them sleep. So here, um, that's not the case. It didn't help them at all. So that tells you it is, you actually need to take the drug to take away the symptoms and, and not just take some random, you know, uh, sugar pill. Any follow-up question? Okay, thank you. I got it. Thank you. Okay, good. Anyone else before I uh, move on? Okay, let's see. That's it for lecture one. Let's move on to lecture two now. What holds atoms together in a water molecule? Um, so water molecule, as you know, is H2O, okay. two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atoms. And what holds the atoms together? That's talking about this bond, right? So that bond is a covalent bond. And this covalent bond represents sharing of electrons. two electrons actually. However, we talked about this in class, even though they're sharing, even though the oxygen and the hydrogen are sharing the electron, it is not an even sharing of electron. The oxygen actually pulls the electron towards itself more. And that makes the oxygen slightly negative. That's what this symbol means. Okay, it's kind of like an eight, but not completely finishing it. Okay, it's called sigma. So slightly negative for the oxygen and slightly positive for the hydrogens. Because of this uneven distribution of electron, the best way to describe a water molecule is that it is polar. Polar means part of the molecule is positive and part of it is negative. And this is caused by uneven distribution. of electron. But keep in mind, overall, the molecule is still neutral. Okay, there, there, there is, is no, no extra or missing electron. Okay, the number of protons and number of neutrons are equal in the molecule. 
they're just not distributed evenly. So we call it polar. Now, what happens if you put an other water molecule next to it? So this hydrogen, again, will be slightly positive, slightly negative here. What interaction exists between two adjacent water molecules? So the slightly negative oxygen will be attracted to the slightly positive hydrogen. This attraction is called hydrogen bond. Okay, It's an interaction between two molecules. And, and it doesn't have to be just between water molecules, right? We learn about hydrogen bonds in other macromolecules. You can find them in proteins. You can find them in um, DNA molecule. Right? It's just talking about an attraction between a slightly positive and a slightly negative part of a molecule. Okay. If you supply radioactive nitrogen atoms, and uh, what that means is something that you can trace and detect, radioactive nitrogen, you can see where they go, you can you know, find out what they're in, uh, and, and you supply this to a cell and let it grow, what molecules will you expect to find them, uh, to find the radioactive labels in? Basically, this question is just another way of asking you what kind of macromolecules will you find nitrogen in? Right? So we, we, we have our macromolecules, the carbohydrates, which are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You have your proteins, which are made up of, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, as well as nitrogen. And if you recall a trace of sulfur, right? Lipids is just CHO. And sometimes, sometimes you will have phosphate as well, right? Phosphate on the phospholipid. And D a nucleic acid. Right. Nucleic acid, we have C, H, O, N, P, everything basically. So if you radioactively label the nitrogen, you will be able to detect it in anything that has a nitrogen in it. So you will find them in proteins, you will find them in nucleic acid. If you label the phosphate, you will find them in the lipids and the nucleic acid. If you label the sulfur, you will only find it in the proteins. Okay. Any questions? All right. Moving on, uh, regarding DNA, what is the monomer of DNA? Well, the monomer of DNA is going to be nucleotide. In fact, nucleotide is also the monomer for RNA, right? And the nucleotide has three parts to it. There is the phosphate, phosphate group, plus a sugar, and in the case of DNA, this is a deoxy ribose sugar, as opposed to a ribose sugar. And it will attach to a nitrogen base. Can someone tell me what the four nitrogen bases are in DNA, please? Is that A, C, um, A, T, C, G? Yeah, you got it. Thank you. A, T, C, N, G. Right? Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay, so that's a nucleotide. 
how are nitrogenous bases classified? So these ATCGs, how do we classify them? Uh, well, there are two categories to them. They could either be a purine, okay, which includes the adenine and the uh, guanine. Uh, and these guys, they have two rings in them, two rings. Okay, so like, I'm just gonna randomly draw one for you. You don't have to know how to draw them. Like, I just wanna show you what it looks like here. So that's one ring, and then you're gonna have another ring here. Okay, so that's a pure ring, double ring. And the other one, the other category is pyrimidine, which is um, going to include everything else. So there's the T and the C, and these ones, um, they only have one ring, one ring to it, okay? something like that. So one ring to it only. And the rule is this, when you, it comes to uh, base pairing, base pairing rule in DNA, a purine always pair, pairs with a pyrimidine. Okay. Purine always pair, pairs with pyrimidine. Okay, so A with T and C goes with G. What force holds the nitrogen bases together along the length of the DNA? So if I have a, like an A, C, T, G, G, T, A, on one strand, the other strand, of course, you can predict, predict using the base pairing rule, which goes T, G, A, C, C, A, T, right? Okay, so what's holding them together along the length? Well, you might remember holding the A and T would be two hydrogen bonds. C and G would be three hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds, and so on and so forth, right? So two hydrogen bonds hold together A and T, and then three hydrogen bonds for C, C, and G. So it's harder to pull apart the um, CGs than it is to pull apart the AT, the A and the T, yeah. What is the significance of base pairing rule? Well, the base pairing rule uh, makes the DNA complementary. Right. What that means is knowing one side, knowing one strand allows us to predict the other strand. Okay, if you know what's on one side, you can figure out what the other side is, complementary. Secondly, uh, the uh, the base pairing rule, where a purine always pairs with a pyrimidine, it keeps a consistent, consistent width across the DNA molecule, right? It's always three rings wide, okay, across. Because okay? remember, the purines are two rings, the pyrimidines one ring. 
And if you always take a purine that pairs with a pyrimidine, it's always going to be three rings across, consistent with. We don't want a leather that's like bulging in one section and then shrinking in the other, right? It's going to make it very difficult to pack and a little bit unstable. So that's what the uh, base pairing rule is. Now, there is another property of DNA uh, that I haven't mentioned yet. I mean, like we learned about it, but like it's it's not in this question. Uh, what's another description for DNA? They are complementary. And then what's the other descriptor? Does anybody remember? No, that's okay. Uh, it's anti-parallel as well, right? That means one strand, it's uh, upside down relative to the other. Right? So they are they are parallel and upside down. Okay, that's it. Number four. Oh, by the way, like when you're studying, right, you should go through our the like the poll questions that we've done in class as well, right? Uh, those tends to be, um, you know, good review questions uh, to uh, to go through. Uh, I, I guess they are kind of scattered all over the place, right? In the uh, in the uh, tutorial um videos maybe i'll put them all together in 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 one slide and uh and upload it after class all right that that probably will be um beneficial for you hey what is uh dehydration synthesis and illustrated with a diagram so we, we we know we have the monomers and then we have the polymers right and uh the um the monomers and the polymers uh, can cycle through one, one form into the other. Okay. So when you join monomers together to form polymers, uh, this is called dehydration synthesis. Okay, so monomers are like these individual building blocks, right? Amino acid for proteins nucleotides for DNA, glucose for carbohydrates, right? And then the polymers is what you get when you link them together. Okay, so you get your polysaccharide, you get your polypeptide. It's possible to break it down as well, right? So when you do break it down, you will get, uh, I mean, you will do a hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. Okay. Now to relate this to what you've learned in lecture four, when when we build things, this is part of anabolism, right? You might remember that. And to break things down, that's part of catabolism. So which one requires energy, anabolism or catabolism? If these happens in a body, which one requires energy? Does anybody remember? Anabolism. That's correct. Anabolism requires energy. Requires energy. And this one gives off energy, right? Gives off energy. All right. Now, in the lecture, we actually did some examples. Okay, so like I, I think I gave you like a little hexagon, if you remember, and then it has an OH on it. And then I say, what happens if you add this to an, a pentagon with OH? Okay, so dehydration synthesis 
would involve taking OH off one of them and H off the other. And you will end up creating a new bond that connects them together, right? So like it's going to connect with this O. And you will have H2O that's being released in the process. So this is, again, dehydration synthesis, right? All right, uh, regarding enzyme, what is an enzyme? So enzymes, they are basically uh, proteins that catalyze, which means speeds up. A chemical reaction in the body. Okay. Reactions would take very long time on their own okay. if, uh, if if you don't speed it up with these uh, enzymes. Okay, it would not be fast enough to keep up with the body's demand and bodily function. So you need these enzymes to help speed up the process. And how does it work? How does an enzyme work? Well, if you remember uh, in class, we talk about um, on a graph, we have energy here. Okay, and then it's just going to be time here at the bottom. So for a certain reaction, let's say we take A plus B to react it to produce C and D. So A plus A and B are your um, reactants, which might start up here, A and B. So it has certain energy to it. But in order for you to react them together, you have to supply a little bit of energy to it, right? So you're going to boost their energy up before it comes back down. So this energy boost is called the activation energy. Okay. And, and this energy could be quite a bit uh, and your, your cell might not be able to supply all that. So in the presence of an enzyme, the enzyme would allow the same reaction to take place, but with lower activation energy. Okay, so enzyme lowers the activation energy, which allows you to do the reaction faster and easier. Okay, think of it like this. If you want to go into the nursing program, you need to have an average of like, you know, 80%. But, uh, you know, they lower the requirement now. You can go in with just 70%. Okay, so it makes it easier to do it. What factors affect the functionality of an enzyme? Well, an enzyme is a protein, and we know proteins are dependent. Um, so a protein's function is dependent on its shape. So anything that affects its shape is going to affect its function. Okay? So we learn a bunch of uh, factors in class that could affect uh, the protein's function, right? Uh, anybody want to give me anything at all? I mean, like we know temperature certainly affects it. Anything other than temperature? pH. pH, that's good. Anyone else? 
other than pH. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, that's fine. Ionic concentration. And that's another one that could affect it. Uh, type of solvent. What are, what are you putting the, the enzyme in? Like, is it is it an aqueous solution? Is it a hydrophilic, hydrophobic solution? That's going to affect the function of the enzyme. All right. Next, what does the enzyme lactase do? So lactase is an enzyme that breaks down lactose. If you begin with lactose and you add some lactase to it, it will break it back down into the monomers. Okay? So lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. In terms of a diagram, it looks something like this. You have your enzyme here with two grooves. And this is the enzyme. And, and that's called the active site. Active site. So your lactose has two parts to it, right? The glucose part and then the galactose part. So in this case, the lactose, which is the molecule that the enzyme is working on, we call that the substrate. Okay, so in this case, the enzyme will break it apart. Right. Let me see if I can draw that again. Okay, same enzyme. But now the bond that holds them together, it's going to be broken. Then you get your glucose and galactose back. So the active site is where the substrate binds to. The substrate is the thing that the enzyme works on. Any questions? All righty then. Let's move on to this chart. Um, so we have our macromolecules here and, uh, let's just fill it in, uh, with what we know. Carbohydrates, the monomers, well, there are three monomers that we talked about, right? Uh, and they generally, they're called monosaccharide. Monosaccharide. An example, examples of monosaccharides include glucose, fructose, and galactose. Of course, the, the monosaccharides can join together to form disaccharide, okay, and... Uh, you probably remember what those are, right? Biological functions. Uh, it is the main energy source. Main energy source. Uh, storage form of energy. Structural support. Right? Those are the key uh, functions. So examples uh, of these things we have for like, you know, energy source, we have uh, things like glucose. That's our main energy source. We learned the whole metabolism of glucose in uh, lecture five. 
Uh, for, for structural support, we have things like chitin, right? cellulose. Chitin forms the shell of insects, crabs, lobster, crustacean, that kind of stuff. Um, cellulose forms the cell wall in plants. In terms of storage form of energy, we have glycogen, which is stored in muscle and liver, as well as starch for, uh, for plants, right? Next, we have the proteins. Uh, monomers for, for proteins is amino acid. There are 20 different types, uh, which we're not gonna list, but uh, remember they all share uh, a key core structures, right? Uh, with the carbon, with the amino group and the acid group. And what distinguished the 20 amino acids is the side chain that they have, right? That they have, right? The R group. Okay. Some are basic, some are acidic, some are polar, some are nonpolar, gives them unique properties, right? Uh, biological function of proteins, well, we have many structural support. So they form structures like horns, nails, hair, and on a molecular level, they form membrane proteins that maintains the integrity of the cell membrane, right? So um, structural support on a, on, a, on a whole animal, whole organism sense, as well as in the microscopic sense. Uh, proteins are sometimes used as energy source as well. Uh, enzymatic activity. Right. Um, there are various membrane proteins. which has various functions, to name a few, signaling, transport, right? Cell cell recognition. There's a whole list of them, right? I'm just gonna put a few here. Uh, example, I mean, like depends what you're looking at, right? So. For structural support, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, well, actually, we did we didn't learn any 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 particular one that represents structural support. Oh, may, maybe maybe for structural support we have like actin. Right? I don't know if you remember. It's one of the microfilaments, uh, and and actin is the main one that forms your muscle. Okay. Uh, enzymatic activities. You can name any enzyme like. You know, lactase, we just talked about that. Uh, another function I just remember is um, hormones. Okay, so for, for things like transport, we have um, sodium potassium pump, right? And a protein hormone would be things like uh, insulin. Yeah. A lot of different types. Okay, moving on, we have lipids. Uh, lipids don't really have monomers, if you remember. They have these components instead. Um, so there is the glycerol and then fatty acids. Right? Uh, it, 
sometimes you're talking about like the phospholipids, you would have phosphate in them. Okay. Or the carbon rings in the steroid. Right. All these are various components. Uh, and in terms of function, structural support for sure. Like your cell membrane has phospholipid. Okay. Uh, we have some lipids for uh, hormones. Okay. So not all hormones are protein based. Many of them are lipid based, such as testosterone, right? estrogen. Right. These are lipid based hormones. And uh, of course, we have energy storage as well, right? which is just your triglyceride, right? Next, we have the nucleic acid, which uh, we talked about quite a bit already in the previous questions. Uh, the nucleotides, that's the monomer. ACTG for DNA, AUTG, uh, AUCG for um, RNA. And the function is to create a genetic code, which helps, amongst other things, protein synthesis, gives you the instruction on how to build proteins, right? Uh, and examples of nucleic acid includes DNA and RNA. That's it. Next, how is the shape and structure of protein stabilized? Well, there are four levels, four levels of structure, right? And starting with the primary, primary structure. The primary structure is essentially the amino acid sequence. So how is that being stabilized? It's being stabilized by covalent, covalent bond. And so this is the most difficult level to break down. If you heat up the protein, if you change the temperature, change the pH, change the ionic concentration, the other levels will unravel, but the primary structure will stay intact. And that's the most difficult one to, to break down. And then we have the secondary structure, which is when this sequence kind of falls up into the alpha helix and the beta sheets, right? So that's the alpha helix. Right, there are these coils and these zigzag. That's the beta sheet. What holds the secondary structure? That would be the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds. Oops, I think the program crashed. Give me a second. Oh man, I lost everything uh, that I just row. Let me see if I can bring that back in. Uh, yep, it's all gone. That's okay. Let me just quickly draw that again. So we have these alpha helixes. 
and beta sheets. And uh, how are they being stabilized? They are stabilized by hydrogen bonds between different parts of the polypeptide backbone. If you don't know what that means, when the um, when the uh, amino acids join together, you you get this long backbone, right? Okay, that forms, and then you you have your side chains coming out. Side chain is like the R group, right? That makes all the amino acid different. So like side chain. R, 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 like that, R. So a bunch of side chain, okay? So the backbone is gonna be able to form hydrogen bonds like that, okay? To help stabilize these zigzag patterns, these beta sheets, or help stabilize the alpha helix, okay? So that, that's what's holding them together. And these are very sensitive to temperature change, ionic concentration, and they would just break down easily um, when those conditions are altered. Next, we have the tertiary structure, okay, tertiary structure. And that is when, you know, you have your overall three-dimensional shape, right, of your protein. So your overall protein might, might have a specific shape, and then you have all these zigzag and helixy insides inside, but then it, it creates like a three-dimensional structure. Overall 3D shape. That's what the tertiary structure refers to. And what stabilized it would be the interaction interactions between side chains. Right? Those R groups that are sticking out, uh, they might have different types of interactions. They might have like ionic interaction. Okay? They might have like hydrophobic interaction. That just means Things that are hydrophobic tends to come together, right? There might be more hydrogen bonds. Okay. The key thing is where the secondary structure is whole, uh, it's caused by interaction of the polypeptide backbone, the overall 3D shape is held together by interaction, interactions between the side chains. Okay. Now, as I mentioned in class, most proteins would stop at this level, but sometimes there is also the quaternary structure. Quaternary structure occurs when you have more than one polypeptide coming together. Right? So you might need to have two pink protein and then two blue ones or something that come together. Right? And individually, they would have their own coil and six eggs, okay, and some of them might only have coils, which is fine, right? but they come together to form a complex, a protein complex, okay? and that's the quaternary structure. An example of something that has that would be uh, hemoglobin, okay? the oxygen-carrying molecule in your blood. That's a protein that has quaternary structure, okay? And, um, and that's the four levels of, uh, of protein structures. All right, here we have a picture to identify the molecules. Right? You should recognize that this 
is an amino acid, right? With a central carbon, this is called the carboxyl group. This is the amino group. Over here, uh, you can see there is the phosphate. There is the sugar. You might not be able to tell whether this is, you know, missing an oxygen or not. Doesn't matter. It's a sugar. And then you have your nitrogen base. So that means this is a nucleotide. nucleotide. Over here we have a glucose. And this one is just a bunch of C and H and that would be a fatty acid. Now is it a saturated fatty acid or is it an unsaturated fatty acid? This one. Saturate. And how do you know it's saturate? Because there are no kings. That's right. There are no kings, no double bonds. Very good. This is uh, saturated. Okay. And these one tends to be solid at room temperature. Right. Okay. That's lecture two. Moving on. We have lecture three. List the major components of cell membrane. Uh, I mean, we, we, we did that already in the tutorial, but you know, just briefly to you know, go over it again. We have the uh, phospholipids, of course. Okay, so we have the hydrophilic heads. facing the inside of the cell, as well as the outside. And in between, we have the hydrophobic tails. Okay, so that forms a phospholipid bilayer. Now embedded in the membrane, we will have these Proteins, okay, so these are called uh, channel proteins. They're integral proteins that goes all the way from one end to the other. Okay, uh, and sometimes, sometimes you will just have proteins that attach to the side, right, to one, one side. It doesn't go all the way through. Okay, so this would be an integral protein. Okay. And then an example of that would be channel protein. Uh, over here, we have the erythral protein. Okay. Now, some of the peripheral protein might play a role in enzymatic activity. It allows you to convert A into B or something like that. Um, also, you have some cholesterol, right? That are embedded within the cell membrane. And we talk about how cholesterol will help control the fluidity. Right? More cholesterol means more fluid. Controls fluidity. Um, other things that you might also want to pay attention to is, uh, I'm just going to draw on the side here. Sometimes you would have a protein and then the protein is going to have some sugar on it, right? Okay. You might have a lipid 
lipid that has sugar on them as well. Right, so that that is what we call a glycolipid, glycoprotein, sugary protein, and sugary lipid, glycolipid. And these, uh, the glycoproteins and the glycolipid, they are important in cell 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 recognition. Okay. Allows the cell to recognize each other. Do does the cell belong to the body? Does it not belong to the body? Do you attack it? Do you not attack it? Okay. That's what these glycoproteins and glycolipids are for. Next, describe the central dogma of biology. Okay, so you might remember, uh, if we look at like a eukaryotic cell or a eukaryote, that's what we are. Our cell, our cells, they have nucleus. Okay, that's the nucleus. In the nucleus, we have double-stranded DNA. Okay, double-stranded DNA. And we want to make a copy of the DNA in the form of single-stranded RNA, right? So this process, when you make a copy of DNA in the form of RNA, that happens in the nucleus. That happens in the nucleus, and we call that the um, transcription. Okay. Once you make the RNA, it will leave the nucleus, and in the cytoplasm you will have the ribosome that comes along. And the ribosome will decode the RNA and make proteins. So that's the amino acids being joined together. Okay, so this process of converting the information on the RNA into a protein, that is the second step, which is translation. Just uh, organize it a little bit better here. So starting at DNA, when you make a copy into RNA, that's transcription. And that happens in the nucleus. And when you take the RNA into the cytoplasm and use it to build protein, that's the translation. Okay, so that, that is called the uh, central dogma of biology. Okay. Let's take a look at the next question. One of the functions of liver is to remove toxin from blood based on this function. Which two organelles would you expect to be abundant in liver cells. So for detoxification, we would want to have some lysosome, right? Lysosome, right? contains digestive enzymes to break down macromolecules. So some toxins could be large proteins that needs to be broken down, and the lysozyme would be able to lysosome would be able to do that uh, for you. Okay. Uh, another one that plays a role in detoxification is the uh, peroxisome. Peroxisome.
Okay, so the paroxysm, uh, sorry, paroxysm, yeah, paroxysm uses uh, oxidation reaction to break down toxins. And then one more is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, they are responsible for synthesizing lipids, but also for the breakdown of lipids. Okay. If the toxins in the blood is lipid-based, then you would need to have the smooth ER. Okay. I know I only asked for two, but then you know any of these two will work. Okay, next we have uh, described the structure of a mitochondrion and state the function of each part. Um, that's pretty standard stuff. We have our outer membrane here, and then you have the inner membrane, right? Outer membrane. We have the inner membrane, which forms the cristae, those finger-like projections, right? And the purpose of that is to increase surface area for reaction. Now this is the matrix, and that is where uh, the oxidative phosphorylation occurs. Sorry, that's where the uh, pyruvate oxidation occurs as well as the Krebs cycle, right? So pyruvate oxidation plus Krebs cycle. you will have your ETC embedded in the cristae, right? And you will have many, many of them, right? So that's the electron transport chain. In between the inner membrane and outer membrane, you have your intermembrane space. Which in terms of functions, it allows H plus gradient to build up. Remember, you're pumping all these H plus, right? Into the intermembrane space so that they will come back into the matrix later on. And in doing so, you will generate uh, ATP. Okay, next one, describe the endomembrane system. All right, so we start with our nucleus. And the nucleus is of course surrounded by the nuclear envelope, right? Now the nuclear envelope continues to extend into the cytoplasm. Okay. And some will have ribosomes on them. Okay. That's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so rough endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for protein synthesis and package 
into vesicles. Okay. So coming off the edge, you might have, you know, a vesicle with some proteins in it. And then there are these ones, the smooth ER, which has no ribosome on them. They are responsible for lipid synthesis and breakdown, okay? Such as the liver question, detoxification. We would need to have the smooth ER. Now, where does this vesicle go? The vesicle will go to a series of membranes, right? Those are called the Goji, Goji body. And our vesicle will go into the Goji body. It will get Sort it, it will get modified and repackaged. Sorts, modified, and repackage vesicles. And then you're going to have a new one, new vesicle that comes out on the other end. So that's the endomembrane system. Now this thing has many different paths, right? Uh, I don't think we have time to go through all of them, but you are encouraged to review that uh, in the tutorial recordings for lecture three. Okay, so for example, it could become a lysosome. It could be released immediately, it could stay in the cell cytoplasm for some time. It could become part of the membrane, so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a good idea to, to review where this thing can go. All right, uh, next one. Explain what passive transport is. So passive transport is basically no ATP needed and it's going from high concentration to low concentration, right? High concentration to low concentration. Example of passive transport, we have diffusion. We have osmosis. Okay. Uh, we also have facilitated. Diffusion. Um, yeah. Honestly, I'm really confused about the active transport and the passive transport. Mm, what could you have a specific um, aspect of it that you're confused about? Um, you see, in the previous test that we did, it it was more of passive transport, and it looks like um, the the passive transport and then the active transport are most similar, I hardly identified the main difference between the passive transport and the active transport. Okay. Yeah, that's my problem. I just want to know the main difference, what differs it? Sure. So okay. for passive transport, we do not need to provide energy. It just happens on its own. It happens spontaneously, okay? You don't need okay. to supply energy and it automatically goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So let's say there is a cell here, and then there is going to be a high glucose on the outside. And then you have low glucose on the inside because you're using up the glucose inside the cell, right? There's a cell. Then on their own, the glucose would just come in. No energy required, just happens on its own. It might need the help of a protein to bring it in, and that would be what we call facilitated diffusion. Sometimes molecules are really small 
okay, something like oxygen. Okay, they're really small, and they will just be able to cross the membrane on their own. And that's diffusion. Okay, water can move on their own as well, and that's called osmosis. So basically, passive transport. The key thing to know is no energy required, and it automatically goes from high to low. Does that oh, make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And for active transport, it's the other way around, right? It requires energy, and then it goes from low to high. Now, uh, there is a question that we did in class a while back. Uh, and again, you're encouraged to go through the videos again if you need a refresher. Um, there is a tube, uh, and there is a membrane at the bottom, uh, and then the water level is the same initially. And then one side has more solute than other than the other side. Excuse me. And uh, the question asks, you know, what's going to happen here to the water to the water level? So uh, again, you can check back the detail explanation, but you should know the water is going to move to the left side. Okay? Because the membrane is selectively permeable, it will not allow the red dots to move. So water will move towards the side that's more concentrated. It's kind of like those hypotonic, hypertonic situation that we learned, right? So as time goes on, the water level will rise on the left and then the water level will drop on the right. Okay, And this will continue to happen until the concentration on both sides are balanced out. Okay, so that's something to... Uh, to look at again, okay? So remember to study. Okay, uh, describe the differences between the various types of bulk transport, right? We can certainly do that. Uh, bulk transport means you move a lot of things across the cell membrane at a time. And that requires energy. Uh, so it's an example of active transport. For bulk transport, it depends on whether you're moving things into the cell or out of the cell. If you're trying to bring things in, then it is called endocytosis. Okay, so this is to bring things in. into the cell. On the other hand, we have exocytosis, which is to send things out, out of the cell. So for endocytosis, depending on what you are bringing in, we are gonna call it different things. You can have phagocytosis, right? Which is bringing in solid. So that's like, you know, if you have a Y cell and then there is a bacterium here and you're gonna eat that. Okay? That's phagocytosis, cell eating. Uh, on the other hand, we have Pinocytosis. Okay, so that's like you have the cell here, and then you have just like mostly fluid, and then the cell is going to engulf those fluid. Okay, so this is cell drinking. And the last type is what we call cell mediated. endocytosis. Right. So uh, the difference is here on the surface of the cell, you would have some receptors. And in order to bring the things in, whatever you're trying to bring in must match the receptors. Okay. So there is these triangle things that bind to the receptor. It will cause this uh, membrane to go around and bring those in. If it's like square looking stuff, so to speak, right? 
you won't be able to bring them in because it doesn't fit the receptor, right? So in order to trigger the endocytosis, they have to match the receptor. So there is more selectivity to it compared to the other two types. Okay. Next one, a cell of a plant that grows in very cold environment was studied, what kind of adaptations do you expect the cell membrane to have? So if it's really cold, that means the cell membrane can become solid very easily. Just think about putting oil in the, uh, in the, in the fridge, right? They, they tend to solidify, right? They tend to become solid. And, and you know, we, don't, we don't really want that for, uh, for the cell membrane because if it becomes too solid, nothing goes through, right? So the adaptations um, that would be needed are things that would make the membrane more fluid. So what are some things that makes membrane more fluid? Well, you would probably need to have higher cholesterol percentage, right? So that's gonna be more fluid, right? right? So if it's more fluid, it's less likely to clump together. Uh, we also need to have higher unsaturated fatty acids. Right, which also makes it more fluid and lower saturated fatty acid. Okay, so all these things are necessary to uh, counteract the solidification. Okay, so these prevents cell membrane from becoming too rigid, too solid at low temperature. Okay. How are active transports similar to facilitated diffusion? How are they different? Okay, so similarity first. Both require membrane proteins. Okay, so active transport uh, 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 requires membrane proteins in, in, in the case of uh, um, like a protein pump. Okay, so EG protein pump. Okay. Facilitated diffusion would be things like um, channel protein or carrier protein. Okay, so both require membrane proteins. Uh, and other uh, similarities is that um, they both um, transport small amount of substance. not bulky stuff, those will require like phagocytosis or, you know, endocytosis, that kind of thing. Differences. So for active transport, uh, that requires ATP, as we mentioned earlier. And it goes from low concentration to high concentration. And for facilitated diffusion, because it's passive transport, no ATP, and it goes from high to low.
All right, lecture five, the last one. What is an organic molecule? An organic molecule is basically uh, any molecule that contains carbon atoms, except, except for CN, CO, and CO2. And the people who came up with this idea of uh, organic molecule decided to exclude those things. Okay. Cyanide, that's the poison. Carbon monoxide, also poisonous. Carbon dioxide, also poisonous if you have too much. List all products of glycolysis. You should know all the products uh, for you know, the major steps, or we had a chart that summarizes all these things. But in terms of glycolysis, the key products would be two net ATP. We're gonna have two NADH. We will have two, uh, uh, um, two pyruvate as well. So those are the key products. And glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, right? In cellular respiration, glucose is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. Explain what that means. So ox glucose is oxidized. It means electrons are removed by, from glucose. And, and of course, those electrons are going to be captured by NAD to produce NADH and FADH2. And then oxygen is reduced. It means electrons are added to oxygen. So these molecules will ultimately put the electron onto oxygen. Not directly, but then you know through the ETC, ultimately the oxygen is going to, uh, to pick them up. Okay. So that's the next question. What is the role of NADH and NADH2? They capture high energy electrons released during glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and Krebs cycle. then deposit them at the electron transport chain. Right? It's a shuttling surface, right? I told you. Just capture these electrons, bring it to the fourth step, fourth step, and that's where you will harness the energy from the electron to make loads of ADP, ATP. All right, in pyruvate oxidation, the second step, right? Three things happen. You remove a carbon dioxide, you remove some electron, and in the process you generate NADH. And then lastly, you'll be adding coenzyme A. And what's the significance of that? Adding coenzyme A will energize the molecule to prepare it to react in Krebs cycle, okay? In class, I told you, right, by the time we get to the, uh, get through the pyruvate oxidation, the molecule is kind of out of energy because we have taken away so much uh, electrons from it, we take away some ATPs from it, we, we produce some ATPs from it. So, you know, it, it needs to be recharged a little bit, it needs to be energized. And that's what the, um, the coenzyme A is going to do. All 
right? There are some calculations that you have to know how to do. Assume a mitochondria contains 50 NADH and 19 FADH2. If each of the energy carriers were used, what is the maximum number of ATP that could be generated? So we learned in class that each NADH can produce up to three ATPs, right? three ATPs per NADH. So if you multiply that together, you would get 150 ATPs. On the other hand, if you have 19 FADH2, we multiply by two ATPs per NADH, uh, per FADH2. That's going to be 38 ATPs. And if you add them together, that will give you a whopping 188 ATPs. It's quite simple, straightforward calculations. Just make sure you have a calculator handy on the test. Should we expect such in the test? Oh, absolutely, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it's pretty simple, right? You just have the times three for NADH and times two for FADH, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the inner mitochondrial map. By the way, like everything on this review, I create this review sheet based on the 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 test questions. Okay, so it's it's a it's a good place to start to review, uh, to to start your studying from. Okay, these are not just random questions that I created. They are, you know, based on. What you will see. Oh, so this is like a gist. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the okay. Gist yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The inner mitochondrial membrane area is five times the area of the outer mitochondrial membrane. What is the purpose of this? Well, we mentioned this multiple times already, right? This is to, to increase surface area for uh, for the for for reactions in the electron transport chain, okay? Which step of cellular respiration generates the greatest number of ATP? That would be the electron transport chain, right? Uh, if you remember the table that we did uh, in lecture five, right, a total of 32 ATP are produced through oxidative phosphorylation at the ETC. Right. The two ATPs that we get from um, glycolysis and the two ATPs that we get from um, Krebs cycles, that, that is substrate level phosphorylation, right? Only accounts for about 11% of all the ATP that we produce. Most of the ATP are produced at the ETC, right? Through substrate level phosphorylation. Now, just very briefly, just remind you how the ATPs are produced. You don't have to draw this. Like, I mean, you've drawn it already uh, before. Uh, you can just listen. If that's the outer membrane, and that's the inner membrane, right? Of the mitochondria. And you will have your membrane proteins here and the ATPase. Okay. So when the NADH comes, it will deposit the electron onto the ETC. So the electron will pass down the chain like that. And as it's doing that, it will pump H plus into the intermembrane space. Over time, you would have high H plus here, and then you would have low H plus in the matrix. The H plus cannot come back in on their own because the inner membrane doesn't let charged particles to go through. And so the only way to come back is to through the ATPase. As this happens, it will turn the ATPase and that causes ADP and P to come together to form ATP. Okay, so the NADH is, in, is, is able to pump enough H plus to create three ATP, 
whereas the FADH2 can only pump enough H plus to generate two ATP. Okay. Now the electron, once it gets to the bottom, you need to take it away, right? So that will be the job of the final electron acceptor, which is oxygen, by the way, O2 is the final electron acceptor. And the purpose of that is to remove electron at the end of ETC. If we don't do that, then the whole ETC is going to get clogged up and you won't be able to make ATP. So that could happen for like a bit of time, then your body switches to fermentation, right? But only for a brief moment. And then, you know, if you don't get enough oxygen, then your body shuts down, right? Um, so that's why we need, we must have the final electron acceptor to remove that electron from the ETC so that the flow can continue to happen and we can continue to make ATP. Okay. Uh, I know it's a lot of stuff to study, um, but I encourage you to uh, make a help sheet, if you would, right? Like a quick reference sheet. Uh, for some of the stuff that you found particularly difficult to, to memorize, right? Um, and then you can just use that to help you uh, during the test. Uh, in terms of the test um, information, all of it is posted on eCentennial. But uh, give me a moment. Let me, let me just go through that with you um, in case you uh, did not have a chance to look at it. Uh, it would be on Wednesday, like I said, this Wednesday. No class on Wednesday. You just have to do the test. Uh, time limit is 80 minutes, which is a lot of time, okay? Um, and it covers everything we just did in the review. Uh, you just have to click on the link and do it. Um, 25 multiple choice questions. 10 multi-select questions. These are questions that has more than one possible um, correct answers. Uh, and you have some 15 application questions as well. So that works out to be six, 60 marks in total, which is worth 20% of your final grade. Okay, uh, it's, it's not particularly difficult. I wouldn't say it's similar to what you did for quiz one and quiz two. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will take all the poll question that I normally do with you guys in class. And then I would, um, I would post it uh, online after class as well. So that way you, you will be able to have some, some things to work on. There are the practice quizzes that of course you can do uh, as well. Uh, but, but seriously, look at the poll questions because some of them are uh, gonna show up uh, on the test as well. Okay, uh, I don't have the Where answers to the. Uh, Where will you post the poll question? Sorry, what's that? Where will you post the um the poll questions? When? Uh, where? 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 Oh, where? Uh, I I'll post like uh, in the announcement. Okay, so when when oh, I uh, okay. post the debrief, okay. it, it will be right there. Okay. Right. Um, the the answers to the poll question, I I don't I don't really have them though. So like, uh, what should um I mean if I I, I I'm sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, I guess I could put the I could put the answer at the like at the um, uh, at the bottom of the PowerPoint slide, right? Let me show you what I mean by that. Hold on, give me a second. Okay, so um, where is it? Okay, so that that's like a poll question. And then uh, I, I will just put the answer like at the bottom here. Okay, at the bottom of the slide. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say this before you go. Um, the PowerPoint slide, I cannot see it. Yeah, it's not in the PowerPoint, okay? Uh, because- No, uh, I mean, not these questions. When I want to read, I am not able to see what's on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, I, I see part of it. I don't see the full picture. You don't see the full picture. Okay, maybe you should. You can download the PDF, right? Because the I po I posted two uh two things, right? The PowerPoint and the PDF. Um, and and I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with um the version of the uh office that you're using. Uh, but there is also the PDF um uh, slides as well, right? No, I realize I was not the only person who is not able to see um the full presentation because I see only half of it. I do not see half. Which lecture uh, are you talking about? Do you know? Almost um, all of them. All of them? 
Yeah. Anyone I'm else experiencing the same problem? Can you guys let me know? Okay, like so, so like if you click on it on eCentennial, right? Like, did you download it onto your computer? Or you just try no. to view it from the browser? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You view it from the browser or you download yeah. it? No, I view it from the browser. Oh, okay, maybe that's why. So you have to click the download button, okay? Download button. Okay, okay. okay and then it goes onto your computer, okay? Yeah. Uh, all right, thank you, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, good luck with the tests, and I'll see you next Wednesday. That's our next synchronous class. Okay, have a good one, guys. Uh, excuse me, Vincent. Sure, I was go ahead. one more question. Just uh, are you going to 